Okay, this is, uh, we're here at uh, Lane Place, the home of the Montgomery County Historical Society, and uh, the date is April 14th, 1999. This is the day that Lincoln was shot. Hmm. Um, the, uh, I'm, my name is Bob Wernley, and I'm the uh, chairman of the local of the oral history section of the Montgomery County Historical Society. Uh, taping this interview today will be Mike Hall, who is the Executive Secretary of the Historical Society. And the man we're going to interview today is Ned Rickett. Uh, Ned, is that your full name? Or that what? is. That's my okay. name. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just Ned? That's right. Okay. And, uh, uh, first of all, Ned, I'm going to ask you to uh, give me your date of birth and uh, where you were born. <clears throat> I was born May 30th, 1917 in Cincinnati, Ohio. And where did you, uh, did you grow up in Cincinnati? Then? No, <clears throat> my mother and father moved to Stark County, Indiana, Bass Lake, Indiana. My father was um, a lawyer who decided he wanted to go into business, so he worked for the Cooper Tire and Rubber Company, Tire Rubber and Rubber Company, and had a territory in northern Indiana and Ohio. Uh, Stark County is that up the northern that's, part of the <coughs> That's the home of Henry Schricker, uh, two-time governor of Indiana. Okay. Um, so Knox, Indiana is the county seat. It's approximately 100 miles north of here. Um, my father died when I was eight years of age, and my mother stayed in Knox, uh, Bass Lake, for a while, and then went and moved to Knox. What What was your What was the, the uh, background of your family? Were they uh, uh, English or? Yes, my my uh, father's family was English. My mother's family was Irish. Uh, my grandfather was an architect in Columbus, Ohio. He spent a lot of time there after my father dead and died. My mother's uh, maiden name was Kerrigan, and her uh, mother's name was Flanagan, so she was she She's Irish. Irish. Uh, <clears throat> my mother graduated from parochial school and uh, then went to business college in Cincinnati and worked for the Tartar, uh, Cooper Tide Rubber Company, and uh, that's where my father and mother met. Okay. Now, uh where, uh, then you're, you grew up in, in that area, and uh, where did you go to high school? I went to high school in Crawfordsville. I went uh, two years to Knox High School, and then we moved to Crawfordsville in 1934, and I uh, graduated from Crawfordsville High School in 1936. Where did you uh, go after that? Or where, did you go to college after that? I went to Wabash and graduated Wabash in 1940. Um, I, my military career started in September of uh, 35. Well, now did you get, you got out of, you got, you completed four years at Wabash. Yes. And uh, you, were you drafted in the service? <laughs> I enlisted in the National Guard as a senior in high school. Okay. Owen Cresilius was the battery commander of Battery B, 139th Field Artillery in Crawfordsville. Uh, an organization that had very distinguished uh, leadership. Dean Kendall, Pete Vaughn, and then ultimately uh, Owen Cresilius. Uh, Owen Cresilius was my history teacher in high school and he recruited me in the hall of high, of high school. He said, would you come into the National Guard? And I talked with my mother. The war uh, was going on over in Europe. 35? No, it was not going on. Uh, war 35, started okay. Yeah. There were clouds all over right. there. That's right. Yeah. Okay. And uh, you mentioned Dean Kendall. Uh, uh, Kendall, who, who was he? Dean Kendall was dean of, of the college uh, at Wabash. He was a World War I veteran, uh, colonel, and um, helped organize the uh, local field artillery battery. And Pete Vaughn was also in that battery. Uh, Pete Vaughn was coach of... Uh, uh, Wabash, a very distinguished 
distinguished individual in athletics. Uh, and the battery had uh, uh, enlisted personnel, who many of whom went on to become officers. For instance, in um, August of 1940, I recruited Bob Welliver as a driver. Um, he was the driver of the um, command car. The um, battery commander um, on Crusius the year before had been thrown out of the jeep on the uh, range, and he said, Lieutenant, I want you to get uh, a man who knows how to drive because I don't want to be thrown out again. Oh, no. And oh, Bob could see this. Uh, Bob uh, Welver ended up a two-star general, commanding oh, no. 38th Division. Now, you're talking about lieutenant. Are you a lieutenant now? Uh, I was in, all through college. I stayed in the National Guard as a non-commissioned officer. When I graduated, I had taken the uh, 20, 10 and 20 series and was commissioned uh, and, uh, a second lieutenant in July of 1940. Now we were preparing for mobilization at that time. We knew it was coming and um, uh, we were scheduled to go to Camp Shelby, Mississippi, but the construction had not been completed at Camp mm -hmm. Shelby, so we were delayed. And we went into uh, federal service in February of 1941. February of 41, okay. So, uh the war hadn't started yet. In uh, America. Yeah, in America. Uh, and uh, you went to Shelby. Camp Shelby. Uh, how, how did you get, did you go in a convoy? Yeah. I was motor officer for Battery B, and uh, uh, we consolidated the uh, vehicles from, uh, I don't remember, three or four vehicle, uh, batteries. And I took them to Camp Shelby. Bob Welliver was my driver. And uh, we would uh, send a scout ahead to determine if a gas station could uh, dispense 1,500 gallons of gasoline mm -hmm. and, uh, and not receive cash for it, receive a government voucher. So I would sit in the back of the command car typing up the voucher as the, as the vehicles were being serviced and uh, fueled. And Bob and I got a big kick out of that. We would say, supposing he never gets his money. <laughs> but I had to keep all those records and no, nobody ever had a question. Everybody was paid. And, uh, okay, uh, how big a uh, convoy was this? Well, I don't recall exactly, but... Uh, well, how many men were that? Uh, it was about 45, 40, 45 men, drivers. We had uh, two men on a vehicle, uh, so some 25 vehicles, I suppose. Okay. These were troop carriers? Uh, those were uh, uh, prime movers because we were artillery, uh, two-wheel, four-wheel drive. Were those Studebakers? No, they were Dodge. <laughs> and when you uh, you got Shelby, where's where's Shelby? Is? Camp Shelby is in Hattiesburg, in the south of Hattiesburg, Mississippi. We went into camp uh, through Hattiesburg at about seven o'clock in the morning, and uh, we were impressed with the activity on the street. Shelby uh, Camp. Hattiesburg at that time looked very much like Crogsville does today. Everything was in bloom. It was in February, but all the blooming trees were in bloom and the flowers were blooming. And I remember so well the black ladies walking down the street with the laundry on their heads and not mm -hmm. anything supporting it. They just balanced the laundry walking mm -hmm. down the street. Quite a sight for a boy from the north. <laughs> uh, and it was. Uh, uh, Cap Shelby, of course, was brand new. He had uh, limited service for a while, but we had Did the tents. Did you have, uh, were you put up in tents then? Or? Yeah, we had, it was a tent, uh, yes. Did, uh, and water, water. Then. there I suppose they were starting to build barracks and so on. Yeah, no barracks. It was always tents. Oh, uh, okay. And Shelby, what, uh, what did you do when you got down to Shelby? Well, we, we uh, got involved in housekeeping. We had a 13-week uh, basic training program that was interrupted because we had to put <coughs> uh, 
streets in and uh, all the, the uh, infrastructure of the, of the community in which we were uh, barracks. You were putting streets in? You mean the, the fellows were laying down pavement? No, just scratching in the dirt. Okay. <laughs> uh, but our 13 weeks uh, basic training had to be repeated because we were uh, so distracted by these housekeeping chores. Uh, but uh, it was a good experience after all. We, we, we were well trained. Yeah. Uh, who were some of the other fellows that you went with that were in your outfit? <coughs> uh, Norwood Hughes, Don DeVoto. Uh, <coughs> Don DeVoto uh, uh, was to become an officer, but uh, uh, he failed his final time physical examination, and that uh, almost destroyed Don because he was. Uh, certainly excited about becoming an officer in the National Guard. Norman Hughes was a, a lieutenant and then promoted on up and retired as a colonel. Um, uh, well, of course, DeBard was our uh, battery Carl executive. DeBard. Carl DeBard was our uh, battery executive officer. You might uh, tell a little bit about Carl DeBard if people won't. Well, Carl DeBard was a football coach and teacher at Brownsville High School. And uh, he, uh, as I said, was a first lieutenant in the battery, as a battery exec, um, but ultimately became commanding general of the 38th Division. Um, he took us through uh, uh, the Pacific. Um, DB was in the hospital at the same time I was for a while, but uh, he was fortunately got out and uh, regained command of the battalion. He was a lieutenant colonel and uh, went into uh, Leyte with the uh, division uh, and came out uh, <coughs> and was ultimately <coughs> promoted to uh, uh, Major General. Okay, now let's, we're back at uh, Shelby. What happens after Shelby? You say there was a 13-week or how? Well, how basic training, all troops went through basic training, 13 weeks. These uh, fellows that uh, were in the Guard hadn't had any training before? Oh yes, we had training as Guardsmen. Our commanding officer of the Guard was the governor of the state. And we were trained... Who was that? Schrigger? Uh, Schrigger was, uh, yes, that was about the time of Henry Schrigger. But um, uh, we were trained to uh, in riot control, flood control. I served in uh, Flood in Evansville in 1936 for two weeks. Uh, I was interrupted in my studies for the final exams in the first semester of Wabash as a freshman. Went down to, uh, uh, to Evansville, spent two weeks and uh, another week recovering from dysentery. Went back to George, uh, Dr. Uh, Dean Kendall, George Kendall, reported to him. He said, well, Report to your professors and pick up your schedule. You're back in school. Okay. Uh, I, you know... But that's the training we no, had as guardsmen. Wait a minute. You, know, it, you mentioned this flood down in Evansville. A lot of people don't know about that. What flood was that? That was the flood on the Ohio River. Uh, and it... Uh, uh, Evansville was protected by dikes, but... Um, the water raised to the point where it backed up into Pigeon Creek. And Pigeon Creek was not, it didn't have dikes on it, so it flooded the city. And um, it was a terrible mess. Uh, I remember seeing, we were, I was enlisted uh, at that time, we were on patrol in boats trying to keep the looters out, and we uh, circled a um, community grocery store. In those times, groceries were on the corner of the intersections. And we toured this store when the water was coming up uh, to uh, three feet of the uh, floor, above the floor. The next time, in eight hours, when we came back, the water had come up to the ceiling and the cat was on the meat block, uh, floating around in the water. <laughs> uh, then, of course, the next time, the, the building was Completely inundated with there were a lot of people who went down there to work on that uh, flood, as I recall. Yeah. That happened when I was in school. Yeah. Uh, Ned, uh, let's go back to Wabash. Uh, when you were in school, uh, 
remember any of the teachers you had? Or? Oh, yes. I, we had Wabash College at that time was, I would say, dirt poor. Uh, who was the president? The president was L.B. Hopkins, uh, whose brother was president of Dartmouth at the time. And uh, Dr. Hopkins was a very fine man. He was the one that brought the comprehensive examination to uh, the students at Wabash. Uh, I think that began in um, about 32 or 34, I'm not sure of the date. Mary Curter remembers it very well because he, he was one who took the, the comprehensive for the first time. I had never had any experience of that kind. Comprehensive examination was over your major and minor could go over the four years of uh, academic training. Uh, Wabash um, had um, uh, an enrollment of uh, probably 500 to 600 men at that time. And uh, faculty uh, were paid very uh, meagerly. I mean, they, the faculty was a wonderful cadre of people, uh, some 12, 14 men. <clears throat> and a couple of women worked through that uh, experience um, from the 20s uh, through, uh, throughout the war. Mention a few of them. Uh, Dean Kettle, of course. Uh, Claire Leavenworth was a French, French professor. Uh, Neil Hudson Pillar was an English professor. Uh, Inslee Osborne was chairman of the English department. Norwood McGantz was chairman of the speech department, a very uh, distinguished person. I had majored in speech, so I knew him quite well. Matter of fact, I, as a freshman, as a sophomore, I had a speech class, and uh, Brigitte told us to speak about something that was uh, well known to us. Don't try to go out to the library and research something. Speak about your experience. So, being in the Guardsman, the National Guard, I got up to speak about the French 75. That was the gun that we were using in those days. And I had Briggy sat at the back of the room, of course, critiquing the speakers. And as I spoke about the nomenclature of French 75, I could see Briggy coming to life. <laughs> His face was uh, uh, very positive, and, and uh, I continued to speak, uh, thinking that uh, maybe I was doing all right. Well, I learned, later learned that he was a captain in the field military during World War I. And the French, uh, uh, French 75 was the gun developed for that war. And so we got along very well. <laughs> uh, Myron Phillips was in the speech department. Uh, Warren Shear, for a while, was in the speech department, was an economist, and of course then went into uh, the uh, Division III history and uh, economics. Uh, others on the campus. Uh, they don't come to me right at the moment, but... Uh, was Ted Groner uh, here at that Ted Groner was here, oh yes, Ted was mighty influential. And uh, uh, the uh, dean, uh, uh, Byron Trippett, uh, was a uh, teacher. He'd just come back from Oxford at that time and uh, was teaching speech, uh, history. Uh, Wabash was a wonderful institution. Those men and faculty hung together through that depression, never complaining one bit about the uh, meager wage that they were getting. Um, was Cars Callan? Cars Callan was coming to my mind. Cars Callan was math professor, and I had trigonometry and college algebra at uh, Karski. And as he would step to the board to uh, erase a problem, put a problem on the board, you could see his shorts in his pants pocket. He had no pan pocket. And some of us said, Briggy, you have no po pockets. Briggy said, so what? I have no money. I don't have anything to put in those pockets. <laughs> he would wear his bearskin coat to chapel and then play his fiddle. And in those days, chapel was compulsory. Now you're talking about, you're talking about Briggy or you're talking about Karski? Karski. Karski Allen. Okay. Karski Allen. All right. Okay. George Karski Allen. Wonderful man. The, of course, the tales of a, of a car scallon's automobile are, are famous. Okay. Yes, he, were, he, he bought a Studebaker and put 16-inch wheels on it because each revolution of a 16-inch wheel would get much better mileage than a 14-inch wheel. 
Oh, okay. And he would coast down uh, West Wabash Avenue because it didn't take gas to coast downhill. <laughs> okay. Well, we're getting <laughs> distracted. <laughs> we're getting distracted, but I think it's important because uh, those are things that happened back in the uh, in your background. Yes. So we're down in Shelby, um, uh, Mississippi, and uh, what uh, happened next? Well, we were on maneuvers uh, uh, frequently. We didn't stay in camp very long, very much. We would go out into the pine forests and uh, have problems, as we call them, working with the infantry, the 151st Infantry uh, Regiment and 139th uh, uh, Field Artillery Battalion uh, were a combat uh, uh, group, and uh, we would have maneuvers, as we call them maneuvering all over Mississippi. And we got into Louisiana uh, a few times. And we would be gone for 13, 15, 18 weeks at a time, <coughs> living in the, on the range. Well, uh, you mean you 18 weeks? Uh, how long did you stay there? Well, we were at Shelby, uh, let's see, in 41, 42. Uh, late 42, we went to Camp, Camp Carabel, Florida, and took amphibious training. Um, amphibious training taught us how to make landings on beaches, uh, how to bring our <coughs> materiel uh, uh, on beach, how to uh, establish the beach, uh, to make a secure beachhead. And uh, <coughs> that was rigorous training. Uh, we were up before daylight every morning and worked until after dark at night. We had two meals a day. You kind of slurred over that name. What were what, Camp Carabel was in the north part of Florida in the Panhandle, way at the north. <coughs> okay. And uh, all right, you were on the same amphibious training out there in the, in the ocean? In the Gulf, yes. Oh, in the Gulf? <coughs> yes, in the, in the Gulf of Mexico. Okay. And... Uh, that uh, amphibious training, uh, did the, was the uh, Army at that time, did they have equipment to make that feasible, to do any, to do any good with it? Oh yes, we had uh, uh, crafts that uh, maneuvered, they were diesel powered boats, so to speak, uh, landing crafts they were called. And they had ramps on the front, and the ramp would go down, and you would disembark the, the uh, craft, uh, and then bring the material ashore. Uh, and uh, that was not Army stuff. That was provided by the engineers. Okay. Uh, well, now the engineers are part of Well, that. I mean, our, our yeah. was not our division. Yeah. This was the 38th Division that uh, we were with. Yeah. Well, <coughs> okay, and... Uh, how long, uh, what other activities did you have down there at this? Where, where is this camp? Uh, Shelby? Camp, no, Camp Clarabel. Camp Clarabel, Florida is in the panhandle of... Uh, is it over near Destin? Or? Yes, in that area. It's okay. uh, west of Destin. Uh, I know for those communities don't come to mind right now. I haven't been down there for a long time. Pensacola. Is Pensacola. Uh, Pensacola is okay. north. Uh, it's, uh, this site is southwest of Pensacola, um, and we were the, we were the first uh, uh, troops to train at Camp Carabel. It was later changed, uh, renamed to Camp Gordon Johnson. <coughs> and uh, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, Marion Kirtley trained there before he went overseas. Uh, we were trained to go to Europe. But our transportation, one of the Queens, I don't remember which one it was, uh, English ship, was disabled. It wasn't sunk, but it was disabled, so we lost our transportation to Europe. <coughs> and uh, were sent back to uh, Camp Livingston, Louisiana. Uh, and that was just a layover, so to speak, until we were shipped out. Uh, 
the morale of the troops at that time was very low because here we had trained hard in amphibious training and we were right back in camp. And we didn't want to be in camp. Uh, we wanted to go someplace. So Francine and I were courting at that time and we decided no, to be married. You know, That's my wife. Yeah, well, uh, wife of 54, 55 explain, years. Explain that. Uh, Francine uh, was the sister of Ed Gantz, who was one of the professors of chemistry at Wabash. Dr. Howell was chairman of the department and Ed Gantz was uh, uh, a professor and primarily a lab person. He trained uh, the students in lab work. Uh, his brother, Hank Gantz, had been at West Point and was washed out there and came to Wabash. Uh, Hank and I were very good friends. As a matter of fact, I recruited Hank and he became a very distinguished soldier, as a matter of fact. Uh, but he was um, a year behind me at Wabash and um, he brought his, from Christmas vacation, he brought a picture of Francine back to the campus. And I so admired that picture that I said, Hank, I've got to meet your sister. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it was in Camp Livingston, Louisiana, where we met, and uh, we were married because I didn't think we were going anyplace. Well, that was in November. <clears throat> you were married at, uh, at the camp. I was married at Wabash College. I got a, you came back? Yes, huh? I got a leave, I came back, and were married Was the chapel, chapel built at that time? Oh, yes, the chapel was built in the 30s. Were you married in the chapel? Married in the chapel, yes. Okay. And um, so uh, uh, we went back in the staff, read an apartment uh, at Livingston, and uh, December the 26th, the day after Christmas, we were uh, put aboard ship uh, in the port of New Orleans. So our marriage lasted just a month and a half <laughs> before I went overseas. I was gone for over what a year. What ship did you get on? You had the uh, Alcoa, USS Alcoa. It was a aluminum company of America, a freighter, and uh, we sailed through the Panama Canal. I woke up, we never, we didn't know where we were going, we were in uni uh, woolen uniforms, uh, this was in February, woolen uniforms. I woke up and I saw huge field pieces, guns, along the coast. And I thought, what were we doing? We were going through the Panama Canal. And here this body, which uh, thought we were going to Europe, dressed in Europe and Woolens, were headed for the Pacific. And we ended up in January at, uh, at Honolulu Harbor in, uh, Hol in Oahu, on Oahu, uh, in Hawaiian Islands. What's the date you got to Hawaii? Uh, we got to, uh, we sailed in December of 43 and arrived January of 44. And I was, um, let's see, let's back up. I was... 44? 44. Yeah. 44. You didn't get there till 44. That's right. It was late in the war. That's right. You'd been uh, training all this time. I ran training all this time. It got pretty old. Uh, but uh, we uh, occupied a uh, village uh, we had four howitzers. We did not take our material materiel with us. We used the material that the troops that had gone on down under, as we called it, had used. So uh, we had four howitzers positioned in four houses, and we pulled a lanyard, which would activate uh, a collapse of the side of the house so that we could fire into the ocean in the Pacific. Um, oh, where, where are we here? Hawaii, Oahu. Oh, okay. Now let me back up, Bob. Uh, I was promoted to first lieutenant <coughs> in March of 1942. <coughs> and uh, uh, in December, in uh, October of 1941, I was sent to Fort Sill, Oklahoma for battery officers training course number 34. Now that means it was just getting started. Um, and I was at Fort Sill when war was declared December the 7th, 1941. That was quite a jolt to be on a regular army base 
uh, and uh, in You're training. You're Fort Sill, Oklahoma. Oklahoma. Yeah. Uh, so <coughs> we. Uh, well, now wait a minute. We're out in the Pacific here, and you. Well, I, I, I went back to the time I was okay. promoted to uh, okay. first lieutenant. Now, uh, uh, at uh, Camp Carabel, I was given command of the headquarters battery of the 139th Field Artillery Battalion. We were having some uh, discipline problems there, and uh, Colonel DeBard put me in command as a first lieutenant. He said, now this is going to be a tough position for a lieutenant, but you've got the ability to do it, and I want you to straighten things out, and I did. Then I was promoted to captain in April of 43, um, and uh, was given command of a firing battery. Now for an artilleryman, commanding a firing battery was it. That was the utopia of the military experience. That was a wonderful experience, being in command of a firing battery. Battery C, which originated in Lebanon, Indiana. Um, then uh, we sailed for the Pacific, and we're in Hawaii now, and I am command of a firing battery. Okay. And uh, did you stop there at uh, Hawaii for any time? Six months. Uh, April 1st, I had been given command of the firing battery in 42, 43. April 1st, 44, I was relieved of that command and promoted to the staff, to battalion staff, as assistant S3. Now the S3 is the fire direction center for the battalion. And uh, from that center, the batteries got their firing orders. Okay. All right, now when you were in Hawaii, uh, uh, did you put up a a tent camp? Or? No, we lived in a, a village, a uh, native village, out in a, 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 a sugarcane field, or an area of a sugarcane. Native village? Native village. And What's that? That's where the natives, that's where the Hawaiians lived when they were harvesting sugarcane and uh, okay, pineapple. Were they, were they huts or something? Yeah, houses. Houses, okay. All right, now uh, you're you're in Hawaii, and uh, what else is happening in the war? Well, we were sending uh, uh, ship after ship of uh, people of uh, different organizations down under, as we call it, uh, down into the uh, South Pacific, where the uh, uh, MacArthur was driving the Japanese. Uh, off the islands, and uh, we would go, uh, would have an occasion to go by Honolulu Harbor and Pearl Harbor, uh, and see the uh, sunken. No, not uh, we did see those. Of course, yeah. that was in '41, but uh, they were equipping ships, small ships, with munitions <coughs> and troops to sail down under to the engagements, mm -hmm. Marines and uh, Army. <clears throat> I remember having to go into uh, Honolulu to uh, recover a sergeant who had been uh, uh, jailed because of drunkenness. We had a lot of trouble with him. And uh, <clears throat> went in to get him one Sunday morning. And as I came over the top of a hill, there was a tremendous explosion in the harbor. Well, we ran, of course, uh, made a beeline for the brig and got this sergeant. And ambulances were streaming to and from the hospitals and uh, brought the sergeant back to the outfit and uh, took care of that situation. But I didn't know during that time what happened. After the war, Francine and I went back to Hawaii to visit. And I rode in the front of a airport limousine with the driver. It was kind of a makeshift, makeshift uh, vehicle. And we passed around Pearl Harbor, or Honolulu Harbor was. I said, I remember seeing ships blowing up in this harbor in 1944, and I've never understood what was the cause of that explosion. He said, I can tell you I was there. 
he worked on the on the docks at that time. <clears throat> they were loading a marine in, uh, uh, battalion for down under, and one of the shells exploded, and there was a chain reaction. There were three ships tied abreast, and all three of them blew up, uh, and that's, that was the cause of that accident. A lot of accidents, of course. Uh, Fortunately, not many of them played that not much life. Okay. Now we're getting we're in Honolulu, and then uh, what do you, you know, you're in these, uh, these buildings, and uh, you're moved, I think you're going to be moved out somewhere. Yes. Where going. I was relieved of uh, command of the sea battery and promoted to the staff. <clears throat> Being a junior staff officer, I was assigned to take the advance party to New Guinea, and uh, that was about in May of 1945. Uh, and I can't tell you the name of the ship, but uh, the whole division, advanced detail, was on that ship. And we landed at Ora Bay, in Ora Bay, Buna, B-U-N-A. Maybe yeah. we're at time when we ought to get some maps out here. All right. Now, uh, the advance detail was uh, shipped to uh, New Guinea to establish uh, the site for the division. Now, that was not any great feat because there had been another division there. They moved down and we moved in. But, um, now you've got to hold this map up, you can't see it there. I don't know that you'll be able to see it, will you? I think so, just... Uh, well, this... <clears throat> Can you hold it up yeah, this way? Yeah, hold it up, kind of. This is Port Moresby, and Buda is over here. This is Buna. We landed there and occupied an area that had been occupied by another division and waited for training, and we were trained there. Well, the Australians had defended New Guinea uh, during an invasion of the Japanese in January of 42. The Japanese had st uh, established their Southwest Pacific headquarters on New Britain. And that was a territorial area for uh, the Australians who thought that the Japanese would never bother with, Japan, with Australia because they were engaged in the Southwest Pacific. Well, they were wrong because the Japanese had in mind taking Port Moresby and then going across the uh, Coral Bay to uh, uh, Australia. Well, uh, Carthage yeah. headquarters. Well, we're, we've got a map of New Guinea up here. Where's Australia from there? Australia's over here. It's off the map. But this is Port Moresby, and it's across the Coral Bay, Oro Bay, no, Coral Bay, to uh, uh, Australia. Now, let me say that in January of 42, the Japanese left New Britain, sailed to Buna, and they had a... a a regiment of battle-hardened Japanese, been in China and Burma, uh, and uh, they came into uh, Buna, expected to come over the mountains. Now the mountains were at Kokoda, which was the peak of the mountains, about 13,000 feet. Come over there to Port Moresby, and the uh, plan was to send a, a fleet around to Port Moresby and then combine with that uh, ground force and take uh, go into Australia. Well, the Battle of Midway changed their plan. They didn't have the, the fleet uh, required to go to Port Moresby. But the, the regiment of Japanese continued their trek along this jungle trail to Kokoda, which is at the 12,000, 13,000 feet level. There they engaged recruits, average age 18 and a half, of the Australian Army. 
when the Australians found that the Japanese were headed for Australia, they discovered that all their forces were in the desert fighting with the British. Mm -hmm. So they had to recruit 18-year-olds, uh, diggers as they called them, and they trained them in Port Moresby. Well, the training consisted of hacking a trail up the mountains, a very steep grade, to Kokoda. And there they engaged Japanese and did not know they were there. 500 diggers uh, engaged 2,000 Japanese. And they fought a retreat action, but very successful. And they were in this engagement, I suppose, six or eight weeks. When finally the Japanese got orders from Imperial Headquarters to withdraw, because they could not supply this uh, force headed for Port Moresby. They were in sight of Port Moresby, mm -hmm. and they had to withdraw back down the trail to Buna, a port ship, and go back to uh, New Britain, their Southwest Headquarters. And that was in 1942. We were there in 1944, two years, mm -hmm. roughly two years later. Mm -hmm. And our mission as a member of the cadre, the uh, Australians convinced the 38th Division to form a cadre to discover how to survive in the jungle. And that, uh, that was my experience in learning to survive in the jungle. I failed that test because I couldn't survive on what we got. I went back to division headquarters to beg for sea rations. And they said, nope, you've got to survive off the jungle. I came out of there by flight. The bar came, came up in the battalion plane, loaded me on the battalion plane, and flew back to a field hospital at about 100 pounds. I had dinghy fever and a terrible shape, and went back to, and then I was in the hospital from, for about uh, four months before I was brought back to the United States. Okay. Well, that uh, then you were uh, you were in a hospital. Where was the hospital? Well, the first hospital was a field hospital um, out in the jungle. The uh, New Guinea jungle is known for a lot of rain. At night it rained all the time, and most of the time in the daytime. But the hot sun would come out, and the temperature would go up to 120 degrees. And this hospital was uh, sheltered by sheet metal. And we'd lay there on our bunks and hear this sheet metal pop as that sun would hit the metal and it would expand. We'd hear it pop. Um, it was a desperate, dreadful place. Uh, dinky fever is no cakewalk. It's a terrible fever, a bone break fever as they called it. Um, and uh, I couldn't regain my weight. So uh, I went down to Milne Bay, which was south of uh, Ora Bay, or Buna, and was admitted to uh, an area, um, a larger hospital, I can't remember what they called it. Um, and then was uh, loaded on to USS Comfort and sent back to uh, San Francisco. Uh, have you ever had any recurrence of the dengue fever? Fortunately, no. I had a very good recovery when I got back home. Uh, I couldn't recover in the jungle. I had jungle rots on my legs. Those were ulcers that would pop out. And you just couldn't heal them in the, in the jungle because it, that's where they originated. And you had to get out of there to get them healed. Uh, but uh, fortunately, I had a lot of sulfur drug. That was before penicillin. Uh, and it uh, was successful in um, bringing a cure for the fever. Mm -hmm. I'd taken Adderin regularly for malaria, so I didn't have that problem. But uh, there was no way to regard against dengue at, least at that time. It probably is now. Uh, but I came back to Brazil uh, in March of 1945, and. Uh, started our family. The first week I was here, Dr. Bergantz, my former speech professor, called saying, I understand you're home. I'd like to like you to come to the chapel. I'm giving a program on Hawaii. He was there on a sabbatical in 1940, 
the early 40s, uh, and had pictures of Briggy was quite a photographer. He said, I'd like you to see my uh, pictures of Hawaii, you'll recognize them. He called them Hawaii. And uh, so I went to the chapel in uniform. I said, Briggy, I don't have civilian clothes. He said, come in uniform. I met Dr. Sparks there at that uh, chapel meeting, went back to the, my mother's apartment in the house in which we're living now, and uh, uh, got a call from uh, Dr. Sparks' secretary, Beverly Bortz, saying, Dr. Sparks would like to see you in his office at 1 o'clock. I said, Beverly, what in the world did I say to bring this on? She said, you'll have to come and find out. So I, Dr. Sparks and I had a conference lasting about two hours, and he said, I want to employ you. I said, I am not a professor type. I did well at Wabash, but I don't want to be, be a professor. He said, I don't want a professor. I want to, you to become my first assistant to the president. It's an office that I am establishing, and I want you to be the first person to take that job. I said, I've got GI Bill. I'm going to college or going to university. He said, work here for a year first. I'll give you a one-year contract, then you can go to school. No, wait a minute. You keep getting ahead of me. Well, that's because you're... I don't want to go back to the beginning with you. Uh, you got all these, all, had all this, all these problems yeah. with yeah. health. Yeah. Did you ever, were you ever been, been shot at? No. No. Okay. And then, nor did I ever shoot anybody. Did, uh, did your outfit ever got... Oh, yes. Oh, yes. The division... The 30th Division left New Guinea and went to Leyte to the Philippines. And okay. they were engaged in a very uh, victorious engagement driving the Japanese off the Philippines. Hank Gantz, my brother-in-law, was a battery commander and he was a forward observer, forward observer. Brought fire down on a machine gun nest the Japanese had that pinned down the regiment that he was uh, with, the regiment of infantry. He was awarded the Purple Heart and the Bronze Star. Mm -hmm. So uh, there was some very good action by the uh, division yep. after they left the game. Okay. Uh, I want to go back one, one further step. Where were you at the time that uh, Pearl Harbor happened? I was in Fort Sill, Oklahoma. And, uh, uh, you were, uh, you remember what you were doing? I was at Beale's Battery Officer's Training Course 34, mm -hmm. <coughs> studying artillery. Okay. All right. Now you're, uh, let's take a breather here. Let's, let's pick that up. And, okay. All right, go ahead and tell us about the uh, your experience in the hospital. Uh, as I said, I came back to the United States aboard USS Comfort. And uh, we disembarked. At, Where, was this a hospital ship? Yes, it was. A real a hospital ship. In a bunk there or what? Oh, uh, in, in a ward. <clears throat> we were on wards the same as we would be on in the hospital. Okay. And I was being treated as though I were in the hospital. Uh, by the way, the Japanese sh uh, sunk that ship, USS Comfort, on the way back to the Pacific. So that's how aggressive they were in those days. Uh, Francine and I uh, met at Temple, Texas. I was uh, shipped by rail uh, to Temple, Texas, the McCus McCluskey General Hospital at Temple. And uh, the Army said, we're going to re uh, retire you because you cannot regain your health in the Pacific. And you're too far gone to be reassigned to Europe. So you're out of here. Uh, so uh, that word was passed on to Francine and she met me at the hospital and it took a little while, two or three weeks to get out because of the paperwork. But I was retired and uh, 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 relieved of active duty. What was your rank at this time? A captain. I was still a captain. I did get promoted while I was in the hospital, of course. Uh, then. Uh, I came back to Crawfordsville 
as I said, I met Dr. Sparks and uh, became uh, assistant to the president. Now in those days, the budget was very tight at the college and Fergus Orms was the controller of the college. He was tight. He was, uh, he was a budgeteer. He, was, he lived by a budget. Dr. Sparks was a wealthy man. He had retired from, he had sold his interest in Arvin Industries at Columbus, Indiana, and gone to uh, uh, California, got his PhD, came back and uh, was selected by the Board of Trustees to be president of Wabash College. And by the way, Bill Moore and I, Bill Moore graduated in 39, a very distinguished uh, lawyer in those days. Uh, He's no longer living. No yes. longer living, that's right. He died of... Uh, Bill Moore, he was the... Man of the Legion here at one time. Yes. His son is practicing law in Lafayette, Kent Moore. But Bill and I came back to the inaugural of Dr. Sparks. This was in 1941, 42 maybe, 42, early 42. L.B. Hopkins died in the summer of 41. And uh, so Bill and I, uh, very good friends during college, Bill called me or I wrote a note saying, uh, let's meet at the college at uh, the inaugural of the new president. He said, I don't know anything about him. I want to know something about him. So uh, we were there at the inauguration of Dr. Sparks. Well, getting back to my employment, uh, Dr. Sparks treated this job in spite of the fact that the budget didn't have money for the job. And uh, Fergus was furious. Uh, you can't do that. And Fergus, uh, and Frank said, watch me. Uh, so. I got $125 a month salary, no automobile, because you couldn't buy an automobile in those days, and I had to get around to the county courthouses to get the names of veterans who were uh, discharged because they had the GI Bill. Uh, Dr. Sparks and I talked about this, and we said, the best source of students is the GI Bill. May of 1945, the V-12 program at Wabash had been disbanded, terminated. We had 39 students for the fall semester. And Dr. Sparks said, now you're director of admissions. We had no admissions department. But he said, now we need students. So that's what you're going to do. I'd been raising money for the uh, Frank Hugh Sparks Center and on the campus and other things. Now you're going to concentrate on getting students. Well, of course, the greatest source of students at Wabash has always been the alumni. The alumni have always stepped forward and, and uh, provided students for uh, admission at Wabash. But that wasn't enough. We decided that we had to tap the GI source. So I went around the county house, uh, courthouses, uh, record, uh, photocopy, well, I didn't photocopy, I didn't have photocopy in those days. I copied the record of GIs coming back and then came back to campus and we wrote letters to them, inviting them come to Wabash. Dr. Sparks and I established a Veterans Counseling Center at the, at the Indianapolis News office on Washington Street on Saturday. And we'd advertise it during the week and veterans would come in to find out about the GI Bill. Nobody knew anything about it. I went to the administrator of the Veterans Administration. I said, give me some information on GI Bill. We don't have any information. So I had to read the law and understand what it was all about. And, uh, but I gave counseling to veterans and, of course, at the same time got their names and told them about Wabash mm -hmm. College. Did you do, <coughs> what were the fruits of that work? Very fruitful. That class was very full, very good. And, uh, and you can look on the college record and the veterans did a tremendous job at Wabash. What, uh, <coughs> what are some of the uh, people that you remember? Well, I don't remember. I have never got that well acquainted with them. There were too many numbers. <laughs> There were new faculty members coming in at that time, weren't there? Well, some. But you see, the old uh, cadre of faculty were still there. Uh, some died. Uh, Fergus, uh, Ferguson was still there. Wasn't Hensley Mud Osberg passed away. And wasn't Mud Howell? Uh, Mud Howell was a uh, Quonset hot area. Whereas it is now the baseball field over on uh, Jefferson Street, um, occupied by the veteran, the Navy. The Navy built that. Well, when uh, the Navy V-12 program was ended, 
Dick Bonnet was uh, in the president's office as a consultant. <laughs> he was a perennial sophomore. He never graduated from Wabash, but he was highly regarded. Uh, and the president would talk to Dick, who knew real estate quite well. Uh, what do we do with these lots of huts? And Dick said, let's leave them up. We'll have married students in here one day, and they can occupy them. And so the married students, veterans, did occupy Mud Hollow, and there are a lot of good stories about that. They mm -hmm. had a good time over there. Who were some of the, uh, the married students? Do you remember that? I don't come? recall. Some had faculty lived over there too, didn't they? No, not uh, not to my knowledge. Maybe there was a faculty member kind of keeping the place in order, but I don't remember that at all. I thought Vic Powell used to have lived over there at one time, every night. No, Vic uh, came on uh, in that era. Uh, I remember him very well. He followed for dance in the speech department. Uh, but I don't think he lived in Mud Hollow. I may be mistaken. We'll have to find out about that. Yeah, well, during the recess here, we were, you were talking about uh, the... Oh, the, Indianapolis. Yeah. Uh, while I was working for the college, uh, I, of course, had this Saturday morning uh, uh, engagement at the news. And uh, Dr. Sparks said, <coughs> you occupy my room at the Columbia Club and uh, stay over there because you, you've got a big day tomorrow. Well, in occupying the room, I was uh, aroused at, after midnight, uh, early in the morning, by a tremendous noise down on the circle. Of course, the Columbia Club is right on the circle. <clears throat> and I couldn't figure out what it was. So I thought, well, this is not going to end. I'll get dressed and see what's going on. So I went down to the desk and said, what's all this commotion on the circle? They said, the Japanese have surrendered. This is VJ Day. And uh, everybody's celebrating. And of course, it was something to celebrate. Can you, uh, can you remember, remember uh, VE Day? VE Day, I remember, yes, but not as uh, well as VJ Day, because I, I don't remember the, I don't know where I was at VE Day. Okay. Uh, working someplace, but I don't recall where it was. All right, after you, uh, uh, how long did you work for the college? Then? A year. I had a one-year contract. I had a, an employment contract and a job description. Yeah. Being a businessman, Frank Sparks saw of those things. I'll tell you another interesting experience that I enjoyed very much. One morning, uh, Fergus Arms came to me on Saturday morning. I was never during the week. I was never home. Francine objected to that strenuously. Here you've been gone for a year and then come back and take a job when you're not home. But uh, Saturday morning I was at the college. Fergus came to me and said, uh, I'd like to see the, <coughs> the president next week uh, if I can. Uh, I've got an important uh, conversation. And as you know, we don't get along very well. So I want you to uh, bring me into the president's office. I said, I'd be happy to. Went to his schedule, put it on the schedule. And the next Saturday, Fergus and I met, and we walked into the president's office. And Dr. Sparks didn't know anything about this. He saw the name on the calendar, but he didn't know much about it. So Fergus walked up. He had a game leg, as you remember. One leg was shorter than the other. And he lipped up to the desk, <coughs> stood almost at attention. Now, Dr. Sparks had been educated at Culver Military Academy, and, and uh, discipline was quite high on his agenda. He almost stood at attention before Dr. Sparks sitting beside the desk. Uh, Dr. Sparks, I appreciate what all you've done for the college. He was trying to uh, calm the waters a little bit. You've never been off the campus except to the War, war Manpower Board. He was on the War Manpower Board in Washington, except to the meetings to Washington. And he said, I admire you. You've been throughout the war without a vacation. Dr. Sparks threw his head, hands behind his head and reared back in his seat, and he said, Fergus, I consider this whole job one grand, glorious vacation. Now, what's on your mind? <laughs> well, with that, Fergus turned on his good leg and walked out. And uh, Dr. Sparks called me back and said, what did the man want? I said, I think he wanted a vacation. Well, why didn't he ask for it? 
<laughs> I said, well, we'll have to do that again, won't we? He said, yes. Tell the man if he wants a vacation, he's entitled to it. <laughs> so, Fergus got his vacation. Hey, Fergus got his vacation. Fergus didn't last very long after that, did he? By the way, you're living in the house that Fergus created. Do you know that? Yes, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> Fergus contacted the contractor, whose name doesn't come to me at the moment. He was a very well-known contractor. Yeah, I've forgotten. And uh, they moved the front of the house to the present location because of the stairway. Yeah, and, we've uh, still got the stairway. And uh, Fergus's wife had not been well, and uh, she and, and they had, didn't have a house. She insisted that they buy that this house was being torn down, save that room with the stairway on it, move it to Lincoln Street, I don't know, was it named that at that time or not? Yeah, Lincoln Street. Yeah. And uh, that's where we'll establish our home. Well, uh, of course, Fergus and I were good friends, so I knew quite a bit about that. Gradually, he got that house built. Fred Totten occupied the house first. I know that. Director of admissions. And he couldn't buy windows. But they could buy storm windows. So he bought storm windows for the house. And all of this was done on a note at the First National Bank. Will Collins was the... Tight. He uh, was tight, too. Yeah, he was a cashier. I don't know that he was pressed. I guess maybe he was pressed at the bank. He was, and, a, he was a fellow with a blue face. Yes, he was. He had a, a very distinct color. But he finally said to Fred, listen, we've got to get a mortgage. The examiners are not going to accept this note indefinitely. And so they wouldn't uh, grant the mortgage until the house had windows. <laughs> and so they bought storm windows and put the storm windows up to qualify for a mortgage. <laughs> and you're, you're living there. <laughs> yeah. uh, where did that house come from? Tell us about that. I can't tell you where it came from. It probably came from over on Wabash Avenue. Oh, I'll where tell you where it came from. came from where the pellet mill is. is it? I knew it was someplace yeah. that would be cleared for. Yeah. I thought maybe it was where the uh, Walt uh, Hamilton's uh, garage is. No, it, it came from over. Uh, that was one of the problems that came from such a distance. That should have a terrible it. time uh, uh, getting under the wires, so, <laughs> getting across the railroad tracks. Ray, Ray was the kind yeah, of yeah, that's name. right. Ray, Ray, Dan or Bert. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, now uh, you've had a <laughs> you had some children after uh, <laughs> after you were now he's going to leave when we get to the family. <laughs> uh, our son Hank, who's taking us to California the 1st of June. We're moving from Crossville reluctantly uh, near our family. The family has said there's nobody left in Indiana, so you've got to come to either the East Coast, where three of us are living, or the West Coast, where Hank is living and his wife. And Hank is the oldest son, oldest child. He was born while I was in uh, New Guinea. And I didn't know it was birth until after we began to correspond. I couldn't correspond on the advanced detail because uh, we couldn't disclose our location. But uh, then we had uh, Dan, who was the second oldest son, who is now a PhD physiological psychologist and uh, director of a uh, uh, research company in Frederick, Maryland. They were headquartered in California. He's a very successful person, retired from the military as a lieutenant colonel from the uh, Medical Services Corps. And Roberta is an actress in New York, uh, very successful, married to a, an actor who is right now in an off-Broadway production, four-character play, three men and one woman. Um, then we had uh, Roger, who died of testicular tumor uh, in uh, 1972, and then we had uh, Carrie, who died in March of last year of, um, of lung cancer, and Ned, our youngest son, who is uh, a commercial artist in New York. He lives on Hudson River, north of New York City. Yeah. 
Uh, you made your living after the war uh, in life insurance. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was, uh, I, uh, Dr. Sparks convinced me not to go to law school, Bob. You got one last lawyer. Yeah. Uh, said, you belong in business. And I said, Dr. Sparks, I have spent all my money trying to live on your $125 a month salary. He said, don't worry about that. Go into the insurance business. It doesn't require capital. So I researched companies for six months at his uh, desk and uh, his uh, encouragement and uh, selected the Penn Mutual. And believe it or not, I'm still, uh, I'm a retired agent now of the Penn Mutual Accuracy Company. Okay. All right. Now let's, uh, let's stop once more. Do uh, you want to talk uh, about the house? Well, uh, Let's pick up on this uh, Wellover thing. All right. Uh, Wellover uh, was uh, a non-commissioned officer in, in the 139th Field Artillery Battalion. But I, what I want to bring, what Mike has brought up here is we have Wellover's tape yes. on file. So if people want to go to the library, they can pick up on this story yes. of what happened after you left the outfit. Right. And uh, you mentioned also a fellow named Barker. Ralph was, Barker was in Yeah, I, I can't remember. I don't remember him being in that same, he could have been in your same unit. Uh -huh. But he was in the Philippines and he's his yeah. tape is at the Crawfordsville Public Library. Yeah, good. What we've got here is a, uh, Ned, is a kind of a mosaic mm -hmm. of, and these things will fit together if people really want to follow sure. up on them. Uh, well, I very much admire you, Bob, for doing uh, this, because otherwise you'd go unnoticed. <laughs> yeah. uh, now, Ned, you mentioned our house. Your house is very interesting. Tell us a little bit about where, where you live and, uh, and uh, uh, what, what the history of your house. Well, as I said, uh, when I came back from the service, I stayed with my Francie and I, and the baby stayed with my mother, who lived on the second floor of the house in which we live now. Uh, and uh, she, uh, uh, I, I bought that house. Uh, well, she, she rented it, did you? No, she owned it on contract. She bought oh. it. I wrote to her and to Francie, and Francie doesn't remember this very clearly, uh, but I wrote to mother saying, while I was in Hawaii, you know, one day this war is going to end, and there's going to be three million men from this theater looking for homes when they come back to the United States, so the house market will go up. So buy a house. I don't care where it is, just get a house. Well, they looked around, and uh, Mother said, you know, the house in which I'm living as a, or a tenant is quite, uh, got a lot of potential. And uh, she said, I'm going to buy that on contract, and you can buy it for me when you get home. And that's what I did. Well, the house was built in 1892 by Noel Klobfelder, who was a wealthy man, uh, but very skilled in prose and poetry. He wrote Early Vanities, we have a copy of that at home, and he wrote um, Snatched from the Poor House, it was a story about a little girl that, uh, whose parents died, and she was headed for the poor house, except the, the, uh, somebody in the, in the county welfare people found that she had some money from some life insurance that her father owned. So she was saved from the poorhouse because of that uh, life mm -hmm. insurance. Of course, he sold that to the life insurance companies. But Noel bought this, built this house, a nine-room Victorian cottage. Now, on Wabash Avenue, right across the street here, we have full-blown Victorian houses, which were 14 rooms on the average, 11-foot ceilings, large rooms. But this Victorian cottage had nine rooms, ten-foot ceilings, rather small rooms in those days. And Noel wanted it to be known as Knoll Cottage. So he built it on a knoll on South Green Street. Now he was a, <coughs> he was a, uh, a maverick. He, he didn't quite fit into the Gold Coast people here on Wabash. And he was glad to get off to himself on Green Street and built a luxurious house. Well, he died seven years later, and his widow and the Davises uh, lived in the house. And they all owned the farms. 
Davis's own farmland south of uh, down in Newmarket, near, near Newmarket. And uh, they lived there for a number of years. The Depression came on, and they died, and uh, a man by the name of Lamb bought the house. And uh, he lost it to uh, a savings loan. I don't know. I have not looked into the record to know which one. Werner Bowers lived across the street. He was sheriff of Montgomery County. And uh, he told me, well, after we bought the house, the history of being ordered by the court to go down to that house and clear it out. There were seven families living in that house with no heat except from the fireplaces. They stripped all the lead pipe out because they could salvage the lead for some uh, cash. And I'm glad they took the lead, of course. And they used the shelving from the, uh, the closets for kindling. And it was all had, uh, every room had a fireplace in it. Well, Bill Bonas, or Dick Bonas' father, Bill Bonas, bought the house from the SNL and converted it into. The savings into, loan. You know. Yes. And converted it to three apartments. One up, which had uh, five rooms, I think, and then two apartments downstairs. They're very really small. So uh, we occupied mother's apartment with her for a while and then occupied a, an apartment downstairs. And I thought we'd sell it and move on to something else. But the more I saw the place, the more I liked it. It was built like a fort, <laughs> still up. and. Um, uh, so we gradually remodeled it to a duplex, apartment up and apartment down, but our family kept growing. So we then converted to one family home. That was 1954. And uh, now we've, uh, we're getting ready to sell it after these 54 years. Okay. So you're moving away and when are you going then? First of June. That's our moving date. We're moving to California. Yep. Okay. I guess that. That's about it then.